This is the last talk, of course, not the least, but uh, now you see this long and technical title uh, called fermion sampling and, and uh, how I, we want to make fermion sampling. So, but don't be afraid. I mean, <clears throat> it's anyway only a 50 minutes talk and obviously I'm not going to go into the technical details. I want to more like <clears throat> give you a feeling what we did in this contribution. So first of all, uh, let me uh, uh, introduce myself as uh, or Andras introduced myself. So I'm at the Wigner Research Center for Physics, but I'm also a member of QWorld and QAngeli. And um, my collaborators were Michał Osmaniek and Nina Tangnamiam, who are from, from the from the uh, Center for Theoretical Physics of the Polish Academy of Sciences. So this is uh, you see my mouse, right? Michał and yes. Nina. And uh, he is, uh, my, I mean, both Michal and Mauro, my uh, <coughs> frequent collaborators. And Mauro Morales is a PhD student at the Technical University of uh, Sydney. Sorry. So I'm going to actually continue where also Akush, also Akush was talking in a previous talk about near term quantum computers. But I'm gonna talk about not how to uh, make them work, but more like what type of uh, algorithms can we run. So, <clears throat> uh, so of course, I mean, the present day quantum computers are noisy, imperfect, and not really scalable. Or if you really want to scale them up to millions of qubits, you have to do something, something new with the technology, even for superconducting qubits. You have to change completely the, for example, the cooling mechanisms and so on, or, or, or the cooling setups. And, um, <clears throat> and those uh, famous, let's say, uh, classical quantum algorithms, so the, those famous alg quantum algorithms from the early times of quantum computing, like the Schwann algorithm, that would really, uh, if, if, if to implement them, you would need like, probably a full-fledged error-corrected quantum computer. And for that, so if you also factor in error correction, you would first of all need small errors. And also, despite of the small errors, you would need a lot of uh, uh, physical qubits to, uh, <clears throat> to make some useful um, machine on, on logical qubits. So, well, in the Although we are hoping that in the midterm this becomes reality, in the very near term, let's say the next five years or so, it's still like a type of science fiction. But of course, maybe in 10, 15 years, we will have something. So here you can see actually this paper uh, by, uh, by a Google researcher and a researcher from the um, Technical Royal Technical Institute uh, Royal Institute of Technology in, in Stockholm, from Craig Green and Martin Eckerow, which is about, <clears throat> uh, they were investigating, the, for example, how many qubits you would need uh, <clears throat> in terms of, for example, for a superconducting device with the same physical gate error rate that we have now. Let's say even if we are optimistic and say that the physical gate errors are 0.1%, then they concluded that uh, to factor a 2048-bit RSA integer, so use for this the Shor algorithm, you would need 20 millions of qubits in the current technology, and we are we are very very far from it. And uh, still, of course, we hope that already in the near term, how long this near term will take, we don't know. We, there will be. Uh, some useful uh, computation with these devices, these NISC devices, as also the previous talk, uh, uh, speaker talked about, which was coined by Preskill in this 2018 paper. And, and uh, I mean, one of the most popular approaches for these near-term quantum computers are so-called variational quantum algorithms. This means that you, you, um, like the 
standard version of this is that, for example, here you have some circuits with some parameters that you can tune. And then suppose that you want to, uh, you have some, um, you have some uh, target uh, function, which is represented by um, some measurable quantity. You can think about, for example, a many body Hamiltonian, but you can uh, also think about some classical uh, optimization problem like Max Scott or, or some spin glass uh, problem, which you can embed as a, as a quantum Hamiltonian and, and for which you want to find a ground state obviously. And then if you have, um, if you have a good ansatz uh, circuits or like parametric circuits, what you can do is actually maybe you are uh, in the case of a VQE, so this variation on quantum eigensolver, when you want to solve, let's say, the ground state of the Hubbard model, maybe you are in a corner of the Hilbert space that would be very hard to simulate with a classical computer, but actually you can measure it. And if you think that the ground state are there, then you hope that with this Anza state, you can actually uh, tune uh, those um, parameters in a way that, that, that the energy goes close to the ground state energy when you measure it. And, and in this, this case, it's like a hybrid algorithm, they say, because actually what you do with the quantum computer is just to produce the state and then measure the energy. And then the optimum of that actual state, the optimizer is a classical, is, is done by a classical computing. So the classical computer will say that after certain measurements and after certain, let's say, uh, uh, ways of, uh, of adjusting the parameters using some algorithm like gradient descent, but it can also be a non-gradient descent type of optimizer, how you, you should choose the optimal parameters and then converge in the end. And this was also done experimentally. For example, in case of this uh, spin glass model, Google made a, a paper with 23 qubits. I mean, it was in the Sycamore uh, quantum computer, which has 53 qubits by they only use 23 qubits and they looked at the max cut problem for three regular graphs it's a graph problem and the, the ground state of the of a type of um, a spin glass model the shannington curve model and they 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 used an optimization called a qaoa or a variation algorithm and they found a pretty good um, they, they found actually evidence that this could be done and for the for the for the case of um, quantum chemistry or quantum physics, what they were doing is that, that they were also, they were able to make uh, also an ansatz of a, gen well, a pretty generic uh, Hartree-Fock wave function for a certain Hamiltonian and uh, then optimize it and, and get the good uh, Hartree-Fock wave function for, for that. Actually, we'll come back to that. There is of course another uh, type of, uh, approach where we say, and this is an alternative paradigm, so let's uh, not care about whether it's a useful problem or not. Let's start, just come out with a problem which we can somehow, <clears throat> which we can somehow solve with a, a near-term device, a, a device that is presently here and we can, we can use it and, and the classical computer would not be able to do it. And it, typically what uh, one is doing is that one is actually over the set of qubits or Q modes in, in, the, in the case of uh, photonic quantum computers, you can, uh, you, can, uh, you can produce a probability distribution, which is very hard to simulate classically for certain reason, I will actually come back to this, or even build a sampler like, a, for example, if you have a classical Ising model in, in arbitrary graph, you can build a Monte Carlo sample, that, which would sample, give you with right probabilities, good samples, like of the of how the, the spin should look like in a, such an Ising model. And, and here I, I, you, can, you can find some examples where you can build up variational circuits or instances of variational circuits where the output probability distribution cannot be predicted by a classical computer efficiently or, or neither can you build by a classical computer a sampler from that uh, probability distribution? So actually the, the pros of this, um, of this idea is that of course you have smaller requirements and even more, furthermore, you can actually make really uh, uh, 
very good hardness claims based on, of course, as in usual in complexity theory on some assumptions or some huge conjectures, which are usually done in complexity theory. But if you, uh, if you do those, uh, if you are, <clears throat> If, if you make those conjectures, you can actually prove rigorously that the, <coughs> that the quantum device can actually perform better than the classical exponentially better. And of course, usually people say that to the converse that, that it's not super practical. And also there is stale noise affecting. And although there are some considerations, you have to factor that in and then it's, it's very hard to verify it's certified. And actually there has been experiments uh, in this paradigm, actually the famous uh, quantum <clears throat> supremacy experiments, now people call it this advantage. Uh, and this was done in, or it was published as this in 2019, uh, October, and, and it was like a random circuit sampling on a 53 qubit sycamore device, actually the same device where those other radiational algorithms were done, but here all the 53 qubits were used. And the depth of the circuit was around 20. And um, they have good evidence that you cannot, with, with the current classical computers, uh, simulate that, may, simulate the, the, the sampling efficiently. And actually, a year and a month later, uh, a, a group in China, actually in Heifei, Shanghai, um, a group based in the University of Science and Technology of uh, China, China, the group of PAM actually made another great uh, quantum advantage experiment, namely with photons. They did with on 100 modes, uh, on average with 50, 70 photons, a so called boson sampling experiment, which I will talk about. <clears throat> of course, there are those issues again, which I talked about that uh, we have to certify it, and, and it's, it's uh, not easy to do that. Okay, what is uh, the boson sampling? The boson sampling is basically a very easy type of experiment. You make a generic interferometer for, for uh, M modes of bosons. Okay, this an interferometer you can describe by your M by N unitary matrix. And you put in, uh, let's say single photons in, in some of the, uh, in, uh, in some of the uh, waveguides and then measure where the photons, uh, what, what are the photon counts that you, what you will come out. And actually the probabilities for these measurements will be related to the permanent of the submatrix of, of, of this U unitary matrix. Okay, so <clears throat> describing the interferometer. So what is the permanent? So the permanent is actually the twin brother of the determinant that we all, all know of. Uh, but actually, if you write up the definition, like, like this cumbersome definition, uh, how you should, uh, from a matrix, extract that, the only uh, difference is that in the permanent, uh, you have these products of elements and the sum of these, and, and uh, we always the sum with the plus sign. And in the case of the determinant, you have to sum, uh, sum it sometimes the minus sign, depending on how you took out the elements. <clears throat> it's related to a sign of a permutation. But, Actually, uh, the this difference is huge between them to calculate because the determinant has very nicely in an algebraic meaning. It's basically the, the product of the eigenvalues. The permanent has also very nice meanings, for example, graph theoretic meanings for, for adjacency graphs uh, and, and so on, but it does not allow uh, efficient calculation. Everybody believes that while the permanent can be calculated uh, efficiently in the number of uh, entries or in the, like if you have an M by N matrix in M, like in M cubed calculation or permanent can be only calculated exponentially uh, in, in the number of entries in time. And like it will actually scale the number of operations like two to the M and the best algorithm does that. And actually this the homo, the homotomy between these two, uh, the bro these two brothers of, of matrix function is one of the main dichotomies in the complexity theory, which was always uh, emphasized by Avi Wittgerson, who got the other prize now. And one of his uh, postdocs, Scott Arenson, uh, actually, uh, when he went, he was, of course, knowing about this dichotomy. And when he came and worked on quantum computing, he saw that 
This permanent naturally rises in uh, photonic systems, as I showed you. And actually, just this, this means that uh, to calculate uh, these probabilities, just for a certain um, for a certain distribution, would be exponentially hard for a classical computer. So probably the sampling will would be exponentially hard neighbor on this and, and showed it. While for fermions, actually, you would if the same setup, you can also do in the same way as you do an interferometer linear bosonic optics, photonic optics, you can do linear fermionic optics. There is an analog of that, basically some unitary that is generated by um, uh, quadratic creation and annihilation operators. In the case of bosons, it would be bosonic creation and uh, annihilation operators. In the case of fermions, fermionic ones. You would get actually the, the, the output probabilities would be proportional to the determinant of, of the submatrix of the unitary matrix. So it, what would happen is that it would be easy to calculate those and actually you can also sample. And uh, this was- Sorry, great... Zotan, you have just passed the 15 minute mark. One, yes, five. I will, I will uh, uh, very fast um, uh, actually end this talk with this slide. And, uh, and basically what we were uh, doing was that, uh, was that we showed that yes, I mean, this is true actually, uh, this insight. However, if you uh, if you put a different input states, not like the one fermion input states, but let's say a little bit more complicated and input states like like zero zero one one plus one one zero zero for each of these quadruples, then the output probabilities would be actually uh, be <clears throat> characterized by something called the mixed discriminant. And actually, they are also hard to calculate. Actually, every permanent can be described as a mixed discriminant. So uh, we also show the average hardness of this uh, thing. So in conclusion, I would say that we introduced a new scheme, which is called fermionic sampling, which can be done on super conducting uh, uh, qubit devices. And you need, don't need a photonic device. And it also has southern, uh, because of these advantages compared to boson sampling. Um, and actually also it has added the random circuit sampling uh, for the case uh, that uh, uh, random uh, uh, circuit sampling that Google was doing. So that's the main conclusion that we have. And since this was the last, um, last talk uh, of this great workshop, I would, uh, in the name of all the speakers and the uh, and all the attendees, because I talked with a lot of them in Discord, would congratulate both the organizers and also the uh, all the program committee for this uh, first uh, Q Science Day. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Zoltan, uh, for the nice talk. Um, even though this is the last talk, it's still possible to discuss. Uh, yes. So. Uh, any questions? I'm checking Discord and the Zoom chat. Uh, Sorry, I have a question. Please go ahead. Uh, do, do we get a certificate uh, for assisting this crew science days? Ah, okay. Oh, thanks uh, first. for the talk. A <laughs> question. So we are still discussing. No, no, no. With... I thought it would be actually when you started, I thought that you would say that can you do a certificate for for fermion sampling. And actually I would have already told you that for that, you have good chance of getting certification better than for random circuit sampling. But for the <laughs> workshop, I'm not that, I'm not, I'm not sure. Okay, so yeah. let's, let's- Thank you, Zoltan. Uh, yeah, really good question. Uh, um, so when do you see fermion sampling becoming a reality? It's just a matter of like putting the circuits on, on whatever Google's or IBM's chip or you see some barriers, potential barriers, which can hinder um, okay. realization. Great question. So, so, so I would say that the, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to reveal too much because we don't have actually, but the proof of principle experiments, I think could be done fast. I mean, to do a real supremacy experiment of the level of uh, what, what Google did. I mean, Google could do this experiment by the way, because these are native gates. These are also called match gates. When you translate these fermionic linear optical gates, these are match gates and they are na native gates, basically. The native gates of the Sycamore processor and usually of transpons are actually of this kind. Mm -hmm. So, and and, uh, and and what we what we were showing was actually a linear in depth. So that's not good. 
but we are now working on on showing at least numerical that you can do square root or even better which was actually done for the random circuit sampling so i don't know i mean it depends what kind of experimentalists we can convince or what kind of experimentalists saw this paper and didn't tell us and are doing something with that. I don't know at the moment, but we are actually trying actively to convince some people and they are, as for the proof of principle, they are seemingly in. All right, uh, thank you very much.